Well, many thanks to all of you who've joined us this evening. Um, I'm Amanda Davison-Young. I'm the CEO of The Tablet, and I'm delighted to um, introduce you to our third in the series of The Tablet Summer School 2024, hosted by Professor Anna Rowlands, who's the Sister Hilda Professor of Catholic Social Thought and Practice. Tonight, we're going to be discussing Catholic social teaching and migration, fair, just and sustainable. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Anna. Many thanks, Anna. Good evening. Thanks to you, Amanda, and for the tablet for um, organising and hosting us uh, this evening for, as you've just said, the third webinar in our Tablet Summer School series. Um, and this evening, we're going to be talking about migration with a panel of three expert speakers, Dr. Marianne Lockery, Dr. Sophie Cartwright and John Pontifex. Between them, they have diverse and importantly deep experience of the question, the reality that we will be discussing. This is a reality, not simply of news headlines, but as Pope Francis insists, of people with faces and names. I think that one of the great gifts of the Catholic social teaching tradition is to help us to reframe the storyline that we use to think about migration as a social reality. Drawing on the long biblical tradition of reflection on both the blessing and the brokenness of migration journeys, the Catholic social teaching tradition reminds us of the divine duty of Christians to offer hospitality and a just welcome to those on the move, and insists, really importantly, on the right of all persons not to be displaced from their communities of origin in the first place. This can be a difficult discussion, as we know from our politics, to have well. And we hope this evening to have the kind of conversation that it would be good, frankly, if our wider political culture were able to have too. Informed, committed, open to a diversity of views and experiences, and orientated to the human dignity of all and the search for a truly common good. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the first of our speakers this evening. And the first thing we need to say is um, happy feast of St. Ignatius to Dr. Marianne Lockery. She's actually only going to be here for the first half of the evening because she's got some appropriately Ignatian celebrations that she needs to be part of. But we're really delighted, uh, Marianne, that you were willing to miss, we have to say, mass in order to come and be with us this evening. So to, just to introduce those of you who don't know um, uh, Marianne to her a little bit. Dr. Marianne Lockery is a Sister of Mercy, a psychologist and a professor at the School of Social Work at Boston College in the USA. She's also an Associate Fellow of Campion Hall, Oxford, and a Research Associate of the Refugee Study Centre in Oxford, where she also previously was the Pedro Arupe Tutor of Migration from 1996 uh, to 2003. She's worked in refugee work with the Jesuit Refugee Service, starting in refugee camps in Southeast Asia in 1988 and has had a long ongoing association with JRS. Her research interests include mental health and psychosocial support in emergencies, the effects of detention on children and climate displacement in the Pacific. In 2010, she was awarded the Order of Australia, the AM, for services to displaced persons. So Marianne, we're absolutely delighted you could make it and very keen to hear from you over to you okay well thank you and um thank you very much to the tablet and thank you to anna for the invitation and my apologies um for having other commitments a bit later today um you'll hear that i have an um, australian accent but i must say i haven't um, lived for a long time in australia for recent years i tend to be in boston or here in oxford and occasionally in rome so, and there's two things that I want to talk about today, um, both of them sort of reflecting that perspective that I have that I'm not in the one country um, often and often in many different countries. I thought I would start though with a, a story. Um, I want to start with a story and to tell you about an initiative I'm part of. Um, I want to tell you the story of a sister who works on the um, border of the, um, in San Diego and Mexico. Um, I went to, I had the chance to visit with um, the sisters along that border in um, April um, this year. And I was really, really impressed with um, the work that they were doing. So just to put it into um, context, as you know, there's a wall um, that that's between America and uh, the USA and Mexico. It's very contentious. And what's been happening in recent years is 
a number of religious orders have been responding to this wall and to the people coming by going to the wall and offering different services. So on this morning when I was with them, it was 6.30 in the morning and we were going to um, the wall because we wanted to be there before the Border Patrol apprehended the people who'd managed to get over the wall. And I was very, very impressed when I got to this um, gate um, in the wall where there was a tent and the tent was run by the American um, Friends Society who are part of the Quakers. And they have this very simple but very powerful presence where they offer, um, just on the American side of the wall, they offer about four things. Um, tea with sugar, lots of sugar were the request, cups of noodle, and also pieces of paper in many languages explaining to the people what would be the next part of the process they'd been in, having managed to get over the wall. But what the sisters do and what the woman I was with in particular, Sandra, was doing was she had eyes on the population because what happens, and it's very much a transitory um, population, people come, some are wounded from having got over the wall, some have taken weeks to get to the wall, um, some have medical problems because they've been on such a long trek. And so the, it's a fleeting ministry where they talk until the Border Patrol comes. We never know when they're going to come. They talk to the people. We had 68 people at the time. And they minister to them with tea or coffee. The friends, um, the Quaker people do a very, very interesting job. What they do is record the um, apprehension should anything be um happening that's inappropriate they've got records of it on camera so they're there all the time but the sisters themselves are actually engaging as much as possible with the population why am I telling you this I'm telling you it because what became very apparent to me when I was there is that we could easily be overwhelmed every day like that day there were 68 people just at that moment I was there but Every day, there's um, sometimes 100 or 50, at least three or four times a day. And in order to combat the um, sense of being overwhelmed, what happens is that the sisters pay particular attention to the vulnerable. They also offer um, a sense of dignity, I'd say, as did the other um, group that was there, the Quakers, a sense of dignity by... Um, telling people what, empowering them. This is what they're going to need to, to know next. Um, this is how it's going to happen. They also were um, friendly. Um, they were um, two or three Cameroonians were there who'd been six weeks coming through um, the whole of um, Latin America. They were asking for um, Sister Sandra to pray with them. So there was a variety of um, responses um, that Sandra was offering but she was mindful all the time of who's the most vulnerable in this group. And also, as I say, offering dignity, offering support. What she also does, because again, I'll, I'll emphasize it's a transitory population, is what she does is um, if somebody is taken to hospital or does end up at the um, Catholic charity shelter and they have a particular need, she then refers them to other organizations that are also working with this population so you've got a population that we're not with for long and this is one of the challenges I think with Catholic social teaching how do we sort of minister to the poor or those on the move who are really literally moving and the principles that I saw Sandra operating out of 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 being friendly supportive compassionate and being and just standing with them in solidarity, I found a very, very powerful sort of um, ministry as such. My role and the role of a few others in this is how do we support people like Sandra, people like the Quakers who are doing this work day in, day out? Because, as I've said, the temptation to be overwhelmed um, the temptation to think what I'm doing is small in the light of this huge um, conversation that's a very negative conversation about the population I'm concerned about is, is um, profound at times. So 
the solidarity of a wider group of the church, um, in, in my case, um, the, the um, major superiors, offering support to Sandra and her congregation and lay people. I'm, I certainly don't want to emphasize that this is only sisters doing this, but that it was in this instance. How do we in turn then offer the support so that when we're not there, they feel supported in their ministry? So it struck me when I was looking at the principles of the Catholic social teachings, which we've been doing here at Campion in the last couple of weeks, the, the opportunity to offer solidarity ourselves, um, yourselves, for people who are on the front line, and for us also to have a sense of what's just and what's unjust in this world that where we're dealing with. Um, I think also what stood out for me was the, the tangible um, work of just making cups of tea, which helped us to kind of really um, have a momentary bond with these people. And they're not just figures. Some of them have stayed with me as um, as people that I sort of now have known along the way. I also know that this is a very exceptional sort of group because some of us work in detention centres or in shelters or in um, cities where we have people for months and years. But I must say this transitory population is one that it globally we bump into. The second thing I was wanting to bring to our attention today is um, I, I did um, hear from Sophie Cartwright um, recently, and I was here in the UK when the new government was elected and the whole question of Rwanda. And what strikes me as somebody who lives in the US, but is from Australia and sometimes here in the UK, is that we sometimes get caught up in looking at our own government. How is our government responding? But what I have seen from moving around in this space for many years now is that this is a global issue. The, the um, proposal to move people to Rwanda is very much based on the Australian um, deterrence model of moving people to Pacific Islands. And they have copied each other in adverted commas or sought advice from each other. The idea of the wall, the idea of the boats, these are global initiatives. There are coalitions of government that are working this way. So the call for us when we want to bring about change, um, the call for us to continue to do, as I'm saying, our um, options for who are the people caught in this, what is the injustice of it, what's the social sin that characterises some of these um, responses to people on the move, I think is a call to a much bigger and global picture of our world. Because it's not just the UK government, it's not just the Australian government, it's a much wider coalition of um, governments trying to prevent what's inevitable. It then gives us the challenge of how do we um, advocate for um, just visas, for pathways for people to move? How do we change the language that um, our community use, our government uses, our church uses, so that we are not joining in the oppression of the people by talking about, you know, unlawful or unauthorized or terms that can be um, putting blame on the people um, who are on the move who don't actually have a lot of options. So I'm really, really wanting to do two things um, today um, in my short presentation. One is to lift up or highlight the individuals and the work that we can do individually. And Sandra's an example and Sandra's um, congregation, the Quakers are another example. There's many, many, many um, of us that are working in that front line. But I'm also wanting to put the light on the fact that this is a global reality. It's not just, as I say, the UK, it's not just Australia, it's a much bigger picture. And we as um, committed members of um, to Catholic social teaching, to um, the messages of Pope Francis, need to have a much wider vision of why is this happening and what can we do to address it at a much higher level than just our local government level. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, that's a really helpful framing and actually is a really nice point of continuity, which you won't realise with the two seminars that we've had already, where this focus on the way in which a Catholic perspective is both personalist, it's a focus on the person and our own personal responsibilities, but also on the structural. Um, so that rather nicely carries on the focus that we've had in the presentations from previous weeks on, on the common good and poverty as well, whilst being totally focused on the reality of migration. Also really helpful to have a sense that Rwanda is something that, although it's kind of not the immediate discourse right now, it's not something that we're simply moving beyond because it's still a global structuring reality. Um, and it's how you engage structurally with, with that kind of reality of the drift towards um, offshoring and, and all the other realities that, that we know in that setting. So thank you so much um, for that contribution. Our second contribution of the evening, which I think will follow up and deepen some of these themes in a specifically UK perspective, will be from Dr. Sophie Cartwright. And Sophie is the Senior Policy Officer at the Jesuit Refugee Service in the UK, where she conducts research and policy analysis on issues relating to asylum and detention. She's worked for JRS UK for seven years, amassing a significant experience of refugee accompaniment and policy work. She's also a research associate at the Centre for Criminology at the University of Oxford and happens to have a PhD in historical theology. So Sophie, we're delighted you could come along um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, it's very good to be here. Thank you um, and thank you also to Marianne. Um, so uh, I am going to, to drill down uh, into the UK context. So first, um, some background. In the UK specifically, JRS works with forcibly displaced people in two contexts. Um, Firstly, people who've been refused asylum and left completely destitute. I'll go into more detail about how this works in a minute. And people in immigration detention. Um, we also did work for a while um, doing outreach at the asylum accommodation uh, camp at a former military barracks at Napier. Um, and uh, JRS focuses on these areas in order to go where the need is greatest and really to, to walk alongside and offer solidarity to people on the very margins, um, hoping to foster hospitality and to promote human dignity in spaces that are really very hostile. And we, we try to work in a very relational way, in promoting encounter. Um, so um, now I, I want to outline um, really what the people we work with have told me about how destitution and detention have impacted them, um, painting with pretty broad brushstrokes, um, and suggest that too often the UK asylum system in common, um, I might add with, with, with many, many others, um, is marked by dehumanisation, and that this is really closely bound up with practices of um, intentionally marginalised people. Um, and I want to think about the ways that the, the structures involved really militate against encounter that like really even up against people meeting each other and 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 and, and building um, relations and they lack the, the whole approach lacks any sense of interdependence um and, and that this kind of lack of any sense of interdependence and, and this practical um militating against encounter really reinforces a denial of dignity and indeed warps the whole a sensible purpose of the asylum system. You know, it's meant to be about offering international protection to people who need it. Too often it doesn't do that. Um, so and the asylum system or many structures within it um, are in the end up wielding power over people seeking sanctuary in a way that treats them often more as objects uh, than as, as like people with agency um, and, and it damages them rather than protecting. Okay, so um, let me outline a little bit how the asylum system works to note the previous government made many changes that are only partially in force. Some of them have been withdrawn. Um, uh, we just um, mentioned Rwanda. Um, it's unclear what will happen now. So to save time, I, I won't detail this immediate policy context, but, but paint with, with a broader brushstrokes. Um, Refugees are faced with wolves at every turn. Um, again, we've already heard about the, the, the global context of this a bit. And um, 
it, in the UK context, um, that this holds true that there are vanishing a few safe, accessible routes to claim asylum in the UK. And recent government policies have focused on building more and more barriers to asylum, or even to reaching the UK at all. Um, then refugees who arrive in the UK have to navigate a complex and difficult process for the government will recognise them as refugees and um, allow them to, to start rebuilding their lives. They face suspicion with people who decide on their claims looking for reasons to refuse them. Um, I've read through um, asylum interviews in the past where you know the people are kind of pulled out for, for like really minor inconsistencies in a grueling um, interview of, of, of um, often sometimes hours. And, and um, it's also very difficult to get legal advice um, without which is very, very difficult to navigate the asylum question and uh, the system. And while waiting for a decision on their claims, um, asylum seekers are banned from working or claiming mainstream support. They have to live on uh, just over seven pounds a day. Asylum accommodation is often dilapidated and squalid to the point of being unsafe. Um, I don't have time to, to go into to all the research for this, but I'm um, happy to, to share some. Um, there is a, a recent trend of placing people in large scale out of town sites, um, typically bleak, prison like, and isolated. So, Napier Barracks, where JRS uh, ran outreach, is one of these. Um, if people have refused asylum, um, this is where JRS um, comes in and starts working with them, they are made completely destitute um, because. Uh, the, the minimal support they were getting from the government is cut off and they're dependent on charity and informal support to just meet their most basic needs to, to have enough to eat, basically. Um, they're homeless and they're often cycling between the streets and couch surfing. They might also be long-term street homeless. And they are subjected to um, the hostile, or as, as it's now formally um, termed, compliant environment agenda. This is a network of laws and policies that seek to make life unbearable for people as a means of immigration control. Uh, the idea is, in theory, to try and get them to leave the UK. And it works by um, excluding people um, from uh, basic um, access to basic services, for example. And this leaves people really vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. So it's, it's very destructive to, to society. And some people who've been here, um, who've come here to seek safety Live in a situation for, for decades. Um, I have so many people say that, but, I, but I've been here. I, I, I've been here fifteen years, and, I, and I'm still, I'm still treading water. Um, and um, then finally, they're recognised as having been refugees all along in many cases. And the refugees that we support, for example, like desperately want to work. They, they really want to participate in society and just get on with their lives. But they're prevented from doing this. They're living in a like indefinite limbo. Um, and this long-term destitution is extremely damaging, uh, for example, to both physical and mental health, and to the way that people even interact with the world. Um, that's um, a, a brief overview. Um, now, detention. Um, in the UK, immigration detention happens in prison-like conditions. Um, the the centres that um, JRS UK um, uh, visits in the Heathrow are um, mainly built to the uh, specifications of a category B, that's a high secure prison. Um, they, they, they really do look like prisons have been there. Um, and um, the decision to, to detain someone is made administratively by a civil servant uh, just to process, um, like to administer immigration procedures. It doesn't go before a judge. Um, so uh, Legal justice is very thin on the ground, and it has no time limit, which is actually extraordinary for a deprivation of liberty. Um, uh, if you compare it with other areas of law, detention is really traumatic. Um, I've spoken to many torture survivors who've been detained, and they regularly say it's like being tortured again. For anyone, it's deeply damaging to mental health. Um, people actually talk about losing their sense of self, and of coming to feel less human, and also concretely becoming less able to engage with the world and do the, the stuff they used to, to do um, because they've been detained. So uh, just to, to give a quote, um, 
from um, someone who contributed to, to previous research I did, you go into detention with all your senses and you come out senseless. Something happens to you, you're no longer the same person. It really, it's a, it's a real like losing of, of, of self and, and a sense of humanity, um, almost of them. Now, listening to people talk about the impact of destitution and detention, it's, it's really clear that there's something very, very wrong here and that the asylum system is, is dehumanizing people. Um, and obviously, um, a, a sense of, of human dignity is, is, is missing in the, in the practices. Do this to people. Um, treating people like this shows a failure to just acknowledge their humanity on a basic level. Um, and then detention and destitution violate dignity. Um, they objectively harm people um, and they make them lose a sense of their own humanity. So this is kind of this dehumanization becomes um, reinforcing. Um, and I'd like to highlight two things here. First, just how much the political practices uh, and structures that do this have, have um, either no sense of good purpose or a very weak sense of good purpose. Um, the suffering inflicted uh, is at least partly the aim of what's happening. There's a policy of creating a hostile environment and even where it's not, it's, it's considered acceptable. Um, and second, dehumanization is, this particular dehumanization anyway, is, is really closely connected with exclusion, cutting people off from basic social goods um, and preventing them from participating. Often you're physically removing them from society um, and um, also de denying them justice. Um, sometimes putting them in spaces like detention much harder to access it. Um, and the barriers built within society um, for uh, people um, who are refused asylum and, and people without immigration status in some way mirror barriers uh, to reaching the UK, to um, getting into the asylum system, and a, just a political emphasis which, that we hear too much on building walls against refugees. So this uh, approach to asylum is characterized on many levels by marginalization and dehumanization together. Um, now, it's it's pretty clear that this stands in really sharp contrast to uh, several principles that CST suggests should shape the, the way we approach politics. Um, so first, the, the common good, um, and that is a, a truly shared good, and one that is measured importantly by considering whether it's good for the person who is most excluded, most vulnerable. Um, and uh, in enforced destitution and detention, we really clearly have structures that um, exclude the most vulnerable and don't have a sense of, of, of any kind of common good, really, that they're pursuing. Um, also absent is a sense that political structures should be built with and for others. Um, I think the, the, the lack of um, space for interaction in um, the structures that place people on the margins is really evident. And, and people talk all the time about how you know, I'm, um, I'm not treated like a human being, I'm just a number. They, they, they don't even listen to me. Um, and this is characterized in particular um, by uh, asymmetrical and often quite brutal um, power relationships. You can see certainly in immigration detention, um, uh, we've recently published a report um, uh, after Brookhouse continued abuse in immigration detention, which um, just shows how people's like most basic rights and even their safety, their physical safety are um, sometimes, are, are, well, are just routinely actually um, abused in in immigration detention um so so there is there is a, 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 a an asexual power relationship going on here in place of a, a space of um encounter and significantly the ideas of the common good and solidarity um are emphasizing human interdependence and relationship whilst 
these aspects of the asylum system militate against it. If you accommodate people seeking asylum by placing them outside of all sites, this is uh, a barrier to forming uh, relationships with local communities. Um, when we were working um, at Napier Barracks and we were asked questions about relationships with local communities, um, which, which, which were very, there, there was speciality, but, but it, I did feel that if you if you'd wanted to um, create a system that, that other people, that, that made them seem um, like scary outsiders, Putting them in a camp like this is how you've done it, um, and also if you if you don't encounter people so much, if there aren't those spaces, if, if there isn't the opportunity to, to do this, it's easier then to dehumanise them and violate their dignity. Um, so through like the exclusion of people and holding people apart. Sophie, just we're just yeah. up to time. So if you've got a concluding uh, sentence, okay. Be... Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Cool. Um, it's uh, um the dehumanization reinforces itself um so this suggests that denial of dignity is fostered partly by a flawed view of human nature and that it's forgotten that we're connected to each other and that our goods are bound up with each other um and that this actually this whole approach isn't good for our society as a whole to be treating people like this um i was yeah i will stop there <laughs> <laughs> that's great Thank you, Sophie. You've covered a huge amount of ground. Um, what's really helpful, I think, in what you've just done is that you've talked about the moral impact of policy, um, but you've also talked about the question of the moral purpose of policy. What's the genuinely good intent that a policy would be set up um, to try to achieve? And I think that's a really helpful focus on both the moral impact of policy, but also the moral purpose of policy and being able to talk about both of those. Just to remind you all that you can be beginning to shape your questions for the discussion slot. So if you want to put them in the chat, Amanda will feed those to me so that we're ready to go with questions um, when it gets to that slot. So last but not least, first of all, we can release Marianne, who needs to go off and do um, appropriate feasting things and thank her. And in the meantime, we will hear from our final speaker, um, John Pontifex. So John is the head of press and public affairs for Aid to the Church in Need in the UK. And that organisation will be very well known to many of us and well respected. Over more than 20 years with the charity, John has travelled widely to countries such as Pakistan, Syria, Iraq and Nigeria to assess religious freedom violations, especially concerning Christians. He has edited ACN Global Reports, including Persecuted and Forgotten, a report on Christians oppressed for their faith, and the Religious Freedom in the World Report. He has led the charity's advocacy outreach on behalf of persecuted and other suffering Christians, both in the UK Parliament and overseas. And I think this is the best claim of the evening. He's also a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. So John, we're absolutely delighted that you could be with us this evening. And I think you'll take this um, debate and discussion in a slightly different direction based on your own expertise. So over to you. Well, thank you very much, Anna, and many thanks to Amanda and the Tablet for this great opportunity to be with you this evening to discuss such a perennially important issue, but one that is particularly critical in our own day. I wanted to begin very quickly with a, a quotation, uh, and it goes like this. No one would exchange his country for a foreign land if his own place of origin afforded the means of living a decent and happy life. And these words are from Pope Leo XIII's landmark encyclical, Rerum Novarum. And of course, they're instructive at so many levels, but they have a particular relevance to where I want to start this evening, because I want to take you back to, to January 2017 and the height of the civil war in Syria. And at that point, after more than four years, the battle for Aleppo had just ended. And working with the apostolic nuncio to Syria and local church leaders, I was among a small group of staff from A to the Church in Need who were granted access to Aleppo. Well, the devastation that we saw at that point was something out of a horror show. It, it doesn't bear description. And it's something that I'll surely never forget. But one memory is particularly strong. 
one especially bleak gray day, we crossed the bomb scarred city and entered the home of a Jesuit. And appropriately for today, uh, being uh, the feast of, of, of uh, St. Uh, uh, Ignatius, uh, the Jesuit uh, Antoine Aldo uh, greeted us there at his home. And it was there that he took us to the very top of the house to find a, a, a warm room because it was so cold. And um, he then took me to the window of the, the house and there we could look over and see all the various places that he knew. And he said, as he looked out of this window, that this was a district packed with Christians. And he knew the families personally. There was the family who had left right at the start of the war and who had now, so his contacts told him, had made it through to Australia. Then there was the young couple who had fled because they didn't want to bring up a child in an unsafe environment. And then there was the large extended family who'd been in Aleppo for generations without number and who had said many times that they would stick it out through thick and thin and who finally had felt they had no option but to leave. And then came the bombshell. And the bombshell was that Aleppo's Christians, formerly up to 250,000 strong, more than 12% of the population of the city before the war, had now fallen to below 30,000. And while obviously so many communities had suffered massive migration, uh, it, it, which, whatever background they may be from, huge numbers had fled for obvious reasons, but few communities had seen a decline as extreme as it was for the Christian communities. And we, we found this has continued with our research and our contacts. The Apostolic Nuncio to Syria, Cardinal Mario Zanari, uh, has indicated as recently as April this year that, according to him, 500 Syrian Christians are leaving the country every day. And he says, we see churches die. Well, during that same visit that when I met uh, Bishop Antoine, we also met another bishop, uh, this time from the Melkite Greek Catholic community, Archbishop Jean Clement Jambard, who's now retired. But back then he was explaining how his cathedral had been bombed several times and how his home had been now rendered um, unusable, um, uninhabitable because it had been bombed so many times. And he said very clearly to us, we will fight with all our strength and act with all available means to give our people the means to stay and not to leave. And this message is one we keep hearing or certainly kept hearing at the time. Please convey to your communities, we were told, that the message that should go out to our people is that they should stay. And of course, um, when you think of Syria as being the, the place where Christians first were given that name Christian and where they have a, a, an unbroken presence going right back to that time, you can see why the bishops feel a great weight of responsibility that Christianity should not die out, as it were, uh, in their region on their watch. And of course, Pope Francis has encapsulated this very same point about how it's important to enable those to stay, to stay. And uh, he says, those who emigrate, ex uh, who emigrate experience separation from their place of origin and often experience a cultural and religious uprooting as well. Fragmentation is also felt by the communities they leave behind, which leave their most vigorous and enterprising elements. So it's very often the old and the frail who are left behind and who feel that vulnerability all the more when younger members of the community leave. But the point is, and we found this again and again, try telling this to those who have suffered so much, to try and get them to stay is, is um, really very uh, a tall order. Um, while we were in Syria, we met a Christian named Tony. And Tony had been in Raqqa, the uh, central headquarters of, of Daesh, as you may recall, in that region. 
And he, in fact, had been uh, bound to a cross. And he described this in great detail when he refused to keep up payments of the jizya. And of course, when eventually he was somehow able to escape and reunited with his family, his first wish was to leave. And he, he asked us, how can you help us to leave? And you couldn't blame him. If you were in that situation, you would be desperate to get out, having been through so much trauma. And for aid to the Church in Eden, other organizations facilitating the option for Christians suffering persecution to stay in their country of origin is, of course, a critical part of what we do. But at the same time, we recognize it's their choice. It's their future. It's their lives. But and so we can only facilitate that uh, capacity to enable them to stay where circumstances make it possible. And one such uh, possibility arose um, uh, when I was in Iraq. So we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Mosul, uh, and more the Nineveh Plains by, uh, by Daesh, which forced a huge number of Christians and many, many others to leave that region. And we were there working with these displaced Christian communities as they took refuge in the likes of Ankara in Erbil, which is about a mile's drive away from the area affected. And of course, these communities were originally desperate to go back as and when Daesh left, which they obviously did eventually after two years. But when they discovered how devastated their homes were as left behind by Daesh, how Daesh had booby-trapped their homes, desecrated their churches and scarred their communities we did a poll at that time among these defaced communities, and they indicated very clearly, we just don't want to go back. We, we, we really want to leave this whole country. But when over a period of time, we were able to start work rebuilding these homes, rebuilding these churches, rebuilding the, the contacts within the community and outside, um, we could see that there was a growing appetite to return. And by the time we got to uh, COVID spring 2020, uh, about 50% of these communities had gone back to some of the larger towns like Karakosh, like Data and Kamlesh, and still more to places less affected like Teleskov. And one of the greatest things I had uh, in my time at ACN has been to visit that very town of Kar to Kar Karamles and Karakosh and see these returned communities. They really did feel there was a future. Um, but what we found at Aid to the Church in Need, that in circumstances where it has been possible to facilitate a return of communities who want to go back to the places which have suffered persecution, where there have been terrible atrocities, the process to facilitate that return cannot be done by the charity sector alone, by the likes of ourselves and other like-minded organisations. And we found uh, that the UK government and other governments, there are others that took a very different view and were very, very supportive and enabling. But there were governments that were very slow, we found, to provide support to enable this process to facilitate the return of Christians who wanted to go back, who indicated they wanted to go back, and others too, to go about that process. And where the opportunity was present to help with rebuilding towns and uh, homes and structures and other things, uh, we found it, it disappointing sometimes that, that support was not there. And I know that was strongly felt by the bishops. So when we look at this whole question of uh, migration, we need also to look at the means by which we can enable Christians to, to stay where possible and to indeed to go back. And Experience shows that given the opportunity to stay in terms of security, housing, education, jobs, many will stay. Um, and in so doing, they will fulfill their prophetic witness among people of very different backgrounds and traditions. And as Cardinal Pizzabella, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, put it only last week, yes, maybe it would be less complicated to leave, to spend our life somewhere else but we receive a call as Christians to live in this land. I'm speaking about 
at the Holy Land, of course, to make our contribution to build our future here in this land. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John, for sharing um, a deeply thought provoking and very visceral account of um, the reality that that many, many people face. Um, and thinking about our responsibility to fellow Christians um, in a context which is the kind of birth context um, for our own faith tradition. Um, so we've got an opportunity now for 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, so if you have got a question um, or a comment or a thought, please put it in the chat box. Um, it'll be richer for everybody if there's a diversity of questions and, and reflections to share. So I want to start with a question myself, and then I'm gonna to come to a question from, from Martin, which I want to put to both um, Sophie and John. So much of what both of you have said in different ways and Marianne touched on as well, is the question of how you shape the story that people hear, how you shape the narrative. And one of the most difficult things, I've worked on migration myself, for, I should own up for um, nearly 20 years as well. So, so I'm sort of drawing on my own experience. One of the things that I think is most difficult is to draw on the narrative that each of you have drawn on this evening and for that to really be a force for shaping and reshaping public debate, or at least for providing a hospitable and open space for a genuine diversity of views to be expressed. From your experience, both of you now have long experience, how do we reshape, shape well, that space of public debate on these issues? John. I think it begins with this whole question of relating this whole question to individuals, to families, people like us. There's a great tendency, I think, to other the whole question of of refugees that that they somehow uh, aren't people that we can relate to, and I for me what's changed it is meeting and having contact, and I'm in daily contact with with a family who are desperate to get out of Pakistan and whose situation is dire, and it's not going to get right. They, there's only one way out, and that's a future out way well away from that country, and. The, so the process of, of reframing has to begin with connecting people here to real lives, which many in many respects are not so dissimilar to, to, to the lives of people back here in the UK. And I think um, in so many ways that then provides an opening by which to see a greater sense of responsibility, uh, a global sense of responsibility, a shared responsibility. We can't just leave these people. They can't just be abandoned. We can't just see it as being other people's problem. Um, and particularly it's incumbent upon us in our, through, our, through our faith to recognize that, that human dignity, but equally um, that dignity is expressed regardless of what faith you share. And I'm, I think that that gives us the confidence to be able to, to, to uh, um, engender these feelings of common humanity uh, and thereby to, to great, gain a greater sense of, of will to act to collectively to bring change for the better. Thank you. Sophie, reframing the debate, how do we do it? Um, well, I would agree that I think um, a human um, human encounter like that is, is really important. And that's why I was saying that I think actually removing people um, from, from spaces of, of um, uh, interaction and encounter is, is actually something that, that uh, Supports dehumanization. So I think that that, that is really important to create spaces where people, yeah, can meet individuals affected. I mean, this is, I'm speaking, I suppose, from, from a UK asylum perspective, if you're thinking of changing the, the minds of people um, uh, in the UK about um, about people who are currently in, in Syria, that obviously it's um, how you go about that's obviously a bit different. But um, there is there is the possibility uh, of um, actually fostering and supporting an encounter between um, be, between people who are seeking asylum here, for example, and um, and local communities, um, and also um, yeah, really bringing out the the stories of of, of human impact that really show that these people. That each one of these people is, is people with, with hopes and dreams, 
and and just lives and people who love them. Um, I think also um, separately from that, I think that, that that really is key to, to starting this and um, challenging the very divisive narrative that we have, but also in a context um, of uh, a, a a cost of living crisis and a politics that often seeks to scapegoat refugees. I think it's it's important to to kind of actively challenge that by um, putting it in in the context of of global justice and uh, and of other um, of lo looking at actual sources of injustice um, uh, on the one hand and and also uh, like thinking. I mean, as as uh, John was saying, well, well, no one would voluntarily leave leave their home, like be putting forced. Um, no one would. What well, no one would be put forced to to, to out, out out their home unless that they really needed to be. Rather, it's kind of putting putting this in in that context. So I th I think yeah, that there is a there's a need to um find a way of putting this in in a broader context in which the divisive scapegoating uh, is is challenged. Sure, thank you. I mean, that, that also raises the, I mean, one of the things that I found over the years um, is it's quite difficult to say to people, as in domestic UK citizens, um, that there's a duty to a solidarity to others if they don't feel a sense of solidarity in their own contexts and from their own national government. So a kind of wider crisis of social solidarity then manifests itself in a kind of absence of a felt sense of solidarity in a, in a global context. So to say to those who feel really isolated and that the world is against them, that they bear a duty to a kind of faceless other it is met with a kind of degree of incomprehension. Um, and that, that the interconnectedness, the interwovenness of the structural and personal issues that, that we face is a really significant part of the story that's kind of difficult to talk about and difficult to tell, but I think manifest when you're having these conversations at a more local level, which kind of links a bit to Martin's um, comment, which is it's a sort of comment question, as it were. Um, it's that genre. Um, so Martin says, we need to educate our population one by one if we are to have any chance of reforming government policy towards refugees and asylum seekers. And he talks about his own experience of seeing huge damage to people going through the asylum system. But he then goes on to say that he thinks that this is symptomatic of a national crisis of our kind of behaviours and the gap between that vision of the what it means to be human in Catholic social teaching and, and what we're living through. So again, seeing the kind of the layers and the interconnection between um, these realities. But he goes on to say that he thinks that there are many people of goodwill, um, of other faiths and non, um, and it's a question of how we can reach out and find those points of solidarity in sort of one-to-one -one relationships. Now, obviously, Marianne, if she was here, would also be speaking about the need for speaking structurally, for thinking about policy interventions, um, and for thinking how you shape that discourse as well. Um, but I don't know if, if either of you have got anything specific you want to say to Martin by way of his um, his response. John? Yeah, on only that... Um... The, the the there is a sense in which on this question uh, people can be very uh, blinkered and just think about their own little world and that that's becoming increasingly untenable as we as we uh, morph into into the the global village and especially through social media that that is challenging uh, this sense in which you know you could you could just batten down the hatches as it were um and I think, that um, uh, increasingly people recognise this is this is an issue that just uh, has to be addressed at a, at a macro level, and it needs to be dealt with in a structural way, and uh, we each need to play our part. And the arguments in favour of a more structural uh, response rather than a sort of blinkered "we just don't want to hear this" um, it, it, it approach is it, becoming increasingly overwhelming. I yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting, John, because one of the things, again, that strikes me often is um, 
never ha in in my lifetime has there and, and i think even in my parents lifetime has there been a need for greater regional and global cooperation in order to address the most significant social issues that we face and just at the moment when we most need that regional and global cooperation we are retreating into mm. new forms of national populism and so we're taking away we're we're kind of disarming ourselves of the very kind of basic resources we need in order to respond well and deal with many of those very obvious sort of crisis moments um, and, and trying to deal with the sort of almost the madness of that really um, whilst doing sane things. And I think mm. Marianne rather beautifully situated that sense of people feel overwhelmed, but there are practical immediate personal things you can do. But equally, you're not mad to feel overwhelmed <laughs> because of the structural disorder. Yeah. And, and those ordering personal acts that she talks about are set within that wider systemic disorder. Um, trying to wrap our heads around that is, is challenging. Sophie, anything you would want to say? And this, this probably, in a minute, I'll get you both just to wrap up. But Sophie, anything you want to say in response to Martin? Well, I, I just to say that I agree that, this, um, that, that the issues um, of um, that we've seen with, with the asylum system are not uh, unique, but are symptomatic of a wider, um, a, a wider problem in how how we respond to each other and how we well, fail to uh, um, protect each other, but also just lack of justice. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm um, because of time, there's no more questions come through other than there's just a couple of comments from Martin um, um, who we've already heard from. So what I'm going to suggest is that I'm going to give each John and Sophie a chance for a kind of final um, sort of 30 to 60 second comment. Um, maybe what are the things that that we haven't quite got to talking about this evening? They're kind of difficult to to address issues. Is there something that isn't on the table in what we've discussed um, that you'd want to kind of place before us or anything you want to offer by way of a brief sort of final, uh, very brief concluding comment? And then I'm going to hand over to Amanda um, to conclude. So, John, a sort of 30 to 60 second thought. Well, my thought would be that if we're to enable communities to either stay in places where there's uh, huge problems and where where the, the 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 challenge of trying to stay is very difficult or getting people to go back they don't just need you know food to eat uh, a house a roof over their head they need a multiplicity of things they need education they need jobs uh, they need health care and it when one of these core elements is missing it the other things may all be very good but if there's no job, and this is what we found in Karakosh, there's no job opportunities. All these other things may be brilliant, but the absence of that one core factor will precipitate a decline. And this is why we've got to have a, a rounded sense of the, the core elements that it constitute capacity to enable uh, safe return and continued sustaining of that return. Thank you. So an integral, personal and structural response in order to enable human flourishing. Sophie. Um, well, uh, I would like to um, again, think, think about placing this, uh, placing the, the forced displacement um, in the broader uh, global context in which it's situated. Um, and, and that is really a context of, of an unequal world um, where some have safety and the conditions for flourishing and, and other people really don't. Um, so, I mean, I know that, that um, you and I have worked um, a, a lot and thought a lot about the universal destination of goods in this context um, and uh, the, the way that forced migration points to like a, a failure to uphold the intention that like the Earth's goods are to meet everyone's needs. Um, and and how this like, radically reorients the way that we think about border management um, to, to think about uh, human need and, and, and common humanity. I think we need to then there's there's another step to this, which is this is all part of a project of trying to to build a juster world um, for for everyone, um, uh, and and that uh, involves um, addressing myriad social problems in, in, for example, those societies as well. 
Thank you. So how do we move towards a more truly universal destination of goods, which was the theme that we talked about last week in the session um, on Catholic social teaching and poverty as well. So another recurring sense of what does it really mean to get to grips with that principle? Thank you um, to Marianne in her absence, now feasting, um, to Sophie and to John um, for your contributions this evening. And there's a kind of soberness to, to discussing a topic um, of this weight and significance also in the context of a worsening situation in the Middle East um, over the last 24 hours as we're having this conversation. So thank you for your contributions and thank you to those of you who've given up your evening to attend. And I'm going to hand back to you, Amanda. Uh, thank you again. There's such a lot to again unpack um, as with all of these webinars. So um, it's really good to um, be able to, you know, talk and just share from the experts in the field. Um, I'm sure we've got lots more questions as well. Um, just going through uh, where we're travelling to next, um, we've got on the 7th of August, um, Catholic Social Teaching and the Environment. Um, so if you want to get the ticket for that, they are still available. And also, if you want to get tickets for any of the webinars that we've had in this series, you can still get them um, on the tablet website. So please do have um, a look for those. Um, coming up, don't forget, we've got Catholic education in the 21st century, challenges and opportunities. Um, we have our guest speaker, Raymond Friel, OBE, CEO of Caritas Social Action Network. That's a live event um, and that'll be on Wednesday, the 16th of October at, in a, a London venue, CCLA Investment Management Offices. Um, so if you'd like to come to that, tickets are available on the website. We have a whole host of new webinars coming out, which will be in the tablet um, next week. So please do have a look out for those. They cover um, all of October and September. September, and then we'll be into our um, autumn series. We still have our pa pa pilgrimages available. So we've got our Patmos pilgrimage, 23rd to the 30th of September, with tour leader Father Nicholas King. And we have a religious pilgrimage uh, to the Jewels of Lake Maggiore and the Advent in Austria. So if you're interested in any of those, all the details of how to um, book those are on the tablet website. And we still have our Andre Rue in Lisbon. Yes, that is a pilgrimage. Um, it is uh, the, uh, you can see Andre Rue, but you can also go walking along a section of the Camino. Um, so again, have a look at that one if you're at all interested. If you're not a subscriber to the Pastoral Review or to the tablet, then you can find all the details of how to subscribe at www.thetablet.co.uk and we are producing a brand new website uh, which will go live in September so do look out for that one. We have our special offer of five for five pounds and you get a free book so if you're not a subscriber do have a look at that. And we also have our free digital offer for any member of family or friend who wants to um, have a go at uh, reading the tablet. Um, again, that would link to a five for five offer, but it's always uh, a really good a starting point to just have a have a dip in. And uh, we're still running our tablet development fund. Um, we are a charity, not for profit, but not for loss. Um, so if you would like to donate to the work of the tablet, which includes these webinars, we'd be very, very grateful. So thank you very much again to our speakers. Thank you to Sister Marianne, uh, to John and also to Sophie. And many, many, many thanks to Anna. This is the third of the four series that she'll be running. Um, and we're very grateful to her for doing our summer school this year. On behalf of myself, the tablet team and everybody that works on these webinars, we'd just like to wish you a very good evening and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care now. Good night. <laughs>